This is the Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigation. We're going after the 5th edition. This is Chapter 2, Investigator's Office and Laboratory. The big things in this chapter we're looking at is, well, what are the requirements for a forensics lab? Both physical requirements and digital forensics lab requirements, uh, hardware and software and things of that nature. We're going to look at it being able to explain the criteria for selecting the appropriate basic forensics workstation. We're going to describe the components that will be used to build a business case for developing a forensics lab. So there's a lot here. There's a lot to this. It's not just, well, I have a computer. I have software. Let's go. So there are a few certification requirements. There is a digital forensics lab certification where you conduct your investigation, where you store the evidence, you house all the appropriate equipment, whether that be physical, hardware, software, and above. There are a few groups that offer guidelines for this whole process. The American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors, ASCLD, is great for some of these guidelines. They talk about how to manage the lab, both access to and from the lab, the equipment, the storage of everything, everything. It also kind of helps walk you through the acquiring an official certification, verifying that your lab is certified. It also goes through some of the auditing lab functions and procedures for, again, ongoing requirements within the certification realm. So lab manager duties normally is it's going to be setting up process for managing cases, promote group consensus. So there's going to be, again, like a leader for this. Maintaining the fiscal responsibilities. Uh, again, the labs can get kind of expensive, software and hardware and all of that good stuff. It's also this managerial component that enforces a specific level of ethical standards. They also deal with planning and updating both the lab, physical environment, hardware, software, equipment, and all of the above. They establish and promote quality assurance process. They set the schedules. Again, typically a very reasonable production schedule, but I mean they control the overall schedule. And they also estimate case amount. Because again, if you can handle one or two cases and you're getting five cases, then you're not going to be able to, to give your due diligence or your best effort on all the additional cases. So there has to be some type of manager that helps manage all of this. They also can estimate when to expect uh, results. They also help create, monitor, audit, and enforce policies. And lastly, it's the whole providing a safe and secure and work free, uh, not work free, but I mean harassment free work zone. Staff members, they're going to typically, uh, they're going to have specific knowledge and training within specific types of hardware, software, file types, operating systems. They're going to be very good at deducting or deductive reasoning, not inductive, but deductive reasoning. Staff members will also work on reviewing regularly uh, their work, normally with the lab manager. The ASCLD does give way more online manuals, and more information, and more policies and procedural templates just to kind of help get this process started. So lab budget planning is always a big one. Normally you want to be able to break down your costs by daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually expenses. That way you can verify that you're going to be able to do it. We're going to use past investigation expenses or ex uh, experts to expect uh, future costs. Basically we look at past trends to kind of help predict the future. So a general question normally is what are some common lab uh, expenses? That's going to be equipment, it's going to be hardware, it's going to be software, training. Training is a huge part of this. And lastly, it's actually about the facility's space. 
do you have the physical space required to handle a case? Are you working out of a 5x5 five five office with five people? I mean, all of this comes into play. One of the nice fun parts about this is additional things could be estimating the number of computer cases you can expect to examine based off of your criteria, like how uh, your space requirements. We also have to take into account technology, scanning time, the speed of our equipment, things of that nature. So how do we do this? We're going to use some type of statistics to determine what type of computer crimes are more likely to occur. That way we're buying hardware and software that fits the, the general type of crime. You don't want to do a uh, mobile forensics in an area that gets one mobile forensics type case a year. You may want to do computer forensics in that area, assuming that they are like a thousand times more likely to occur. So it just it kind of depends based off of the outlook for the types of crimes in your area. We will use this information to plan ahead because again, all of this goes back to the requirements and the costs of our lab based off of the tools, based off of the hardware purchase and the equipment purchase. So there's a lot of things that go in here. So we can check statistics from the Uniform Crime Report or for federal reports, we can look at the FBI's UCR, sorry, UCR uh, crime reports. We can identify crimes committed within specialized software. When we're setting up a lab for a private company, we can uh, again look at the appropriate hardware and software and equipment inventory, look at the past uh, issues, whether uh, it was reported. Well, let's use those past reports to try to build future developments. And then we're also going to look at future actual development within the computer technology. So if we see that in our area, we may see network-based crimes increasing. We may start getting technology or training in those areas. A great example is specialized staff being trained on how to recover items off of an SSD. Traditional mechanical drives, as they slowly went away, you start getting into the SSD uh, market. Do you have the appropriate hardware, software, and training in order to do that? The biggest thing when it comes to lab budgeting is time management. There is always a major issue when choosing the appropriate software and hardware to purchase. Because again, there's a lot of options out there. So let's look at some basic lab budgeting planning. So these are crime stats for 2016 for different areas. If we're looking at different types of software and hardware. If we're looking for child pornography, what areas may we be, uh, be looking at trying to develop? Well, normally child pornography is dealing with hard drives, more predominantly on the Windows operating system, or on mobile devices. Oh, well here it says mobile devices, there are 23 cases as opposed to Windows, it's only 14. So we'll probably start looking at, can we facilitate the investigation of child pornography using mobile devices? Or using that are actually using the mobile device to view pornography. If we're looking at embezzlement, we're gonna see that it's hard drive and operating, uh, hard drive and Windows OS are pretty similar. All other areas like Linux and Mac aren't really there. So we're going to use these types of charts to figure out what type of hardware, what type of software, what type of training we're going to need. So let's talk about the acquiring certification and the appropriate training. One of the biggest things is updating your skills through the training that's going to be time intensive. It's going to require a lot of money, typically. Training is not cheap, but there are ways out there. There are also a few types of organizations that kind of help go through it. The International Association of Computer Investigation Specialists, IACIS, they, uh, they help. They also create uh, by police officers who want to formalize credentials in computing investigation.
So this is done by investigators because they got tired of no centralized certification or training to help kind of standardize the computer investigation process. Candidates who complete the IACIS tests are designed or designated as a computer forensics, sorry, a certified forensics computer examiner, CFCE. Sorry, there are so many acronyms trying to, to work with this. I actually just got a computer forensic certification, so the CFC. So all of the different acronyms, it's got to be careful. ISC squared has a certified cyber forensics professional, also known as the CCFP. They require knowledge in digital forensics, malware, incident response, e-discovery, and a few other dis uh, investigation disciplines as well. So again, there are also things like the high tech crime network, in case uh, certification. We have the Access Data Certified Examiners, or the ACE. We have the other forms of training done through like EC Council and SANS and the De uh, Defense Cyber Investigation Training Academy. So there's lots of groups out here that do this. Others can also include like the International Society for Forensics Computing Examiners, ISFCE, High Tech Crime Consortium, the CTIE, Federal Law Enforcement, so forth and so forth and so forth. There are many certifications out there for forensics investigators. You just have to figure out which areas are going to be the most reputable in your area and what certifications are going to give you the type of recognition that you need. Not all certifications are equal. The next big thing is physical requirements. That's going to be a huge part because we're going to be conducting our investigations in a physical environment, in a room, in an office. So we have to understand, well, how big of an office do we need? How do we secure the equipment? How do we secure the evidence? How do, how do we provide a safe and secure physical environment for us to be able to do our work in? Keep inventory, keep control of our assets, keep control of our devices and our software, how to order new supplies. These are huge areas that uh, offices have to be able to figure out. One of the big areas also is being able to secure your facility. Uh, we have to make sure that we can preserve the integrity of our evidence that is collected. Meaning if we're using a shared office and we have no locking cabinets or we have one locking cabinet but everyone has the key, things like that. Also, what are some of the minimum requirements? A small room with a true uh, floor to ceiling wall. Is, is that even a thing? Or are they doing fake wall? Are they doing a, a eight foot wall, but there's an, a foot gap on the, the, the top? You'll be surprised how many people do some really janky things to convert spaces that they need to labs. We also have to make sure that we have the appropriate door access and the appropriate cabinet access. Again, normally with a locking mechanism. We have to have a way to secure containers. We have to have a way to keep logs of who's coming and going. People that work together should have the same access level. That, that's kind of subjective because typically uh, you may have people with higher level access, but those that are working in the same room at the same time should all be able to have the same level of access. If something with a higher level access comes in, then staff may need to be uh, evacuated so that the higher level stuff can be at worked on. But again, normally we're keeping everything within the same realm of access. We need to make sure that we have a fully understandable staff when it comes to all of the appropriate policies, meaning all staff needs to be trained on the appropriate policies and procedures of our organization. Not just security policies, but all policies governing the way that our facility runs. This is critical and happens to fail at most organizations. So when we're conducting a high-risk investigation, that normally demands higher level of security than a minimum lab requirement. So again, we're going to be looking at other organizations and how they've done it. So they have the Tempest facility, 
They have the electromagnetic radiation, EMR, proofed type rooms. They are fairly expensive and this may not work for your environment. So you're going to have to understand what demands are going to be placed on your labs based off of well, the way that your lab is set up. That dictates the type of work that you're going to be able to do. Let's go on to using evidence containers. Normally these can be anything that's lockable, but they're commonly referred to as evidence lockers. They have to be able to be secured. That means no unauthorized person can easily access them. Again, if they're locked in a cabinet and that cabinet is in a locked room, is that reasonable? We have recommendations for secured storage. Again, normally locating them behind a locked door. Limit the appropriate uh, people that have access to them. Always maintain a record of who's coming and going near them or who has access to them, whether it be a written log, a video camera, locks, things of that nature. Also, the containers should always remain locked, it, even when in use. You unlock them to get what you need, you pull the, what you need out, and you relock it. There is no leaving them unlocked. If a combination lock system is used, provide the same level of security for the combination as of the container contents. Destroy any previous combinations after setting up a new combination and allow only authorized personnel to change the lock combination. And again, change the combination frequently at probably every 90 days or when required. If we are creating a lock cabinet with a combination lock and there's medium sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, information inside of it, that's fine. That means everything will be classified medium. If it's all medium, but we stick a high profile item in there, then everything in that uh, lockbox will be considered medium. So because we're sticking a higher sensitive item in that locking area, we need to, again, up our security to it. Because again, before, we were only securing it to a medium standard. If we're using a keypad lock, a point of key custodian, who's going to control access to it? Maybe stamp sequential numbers on each duplicate key. That way we can verify who's having what key. Cameras. That way we can verify who's get, getting access to it. Monthly audits or regular audits. Make sure to do regular inventory of keys. Make sure the keys are in a lockable container. That way just not anyone has access to them. Again, maintain the same level of security as for the keys as the container itself and change locks regularly or as needed. That's going to be based off of your organizational policy, but there's room there. Depending on what you're looking or going after, you may have to uh, worry about the way that the cabinets are constructed. Are they made from steel? Are they made from aluminum? Are they made from wood? There's going to be some considerations here. Uh, if possible, you can think about a safe. Even a small media safe just for software or small things, flash drives, hard drives. Some organizations even look at building a evidence storage room. Again, normally some type of chain link fence that's securing a room, wrapped around the room, so it's in this nice metal box. It just kind of depends. Always keep an evidence log every time that you touch anything. Update it. Verify it. Anytime that you open the lock, even if nothing is removed, document it, everything. A big part of this goes with the overseeing the facility maintenance. Uh, anytime there's physical damage, anytime there is an issue, anytime there is people that are foreign to the room, uh, cleaning crews, for example, gotta document everything. Minimize the risk of static electricity. Um, Normally make sure the room has the appropriate environment controls, make sure things are kept clean, carpet, floors, wood tile, everything. Also make sure uh, counters are wiped down and again cleaned and uh, separate trash cans are a big thing. What is going to be okay to be thrown away versus what's going to be needing to be destroyed? Normally 
when you get in depth with this, you hire specialized companies for uh, data disposal. There is a data disposal certification for the specialized companies. That way, you can verify that these companies are correctly destroying your data or destroying any sensitive material that uh, you're discarding. Physical security. Uh, first of all, enforce your policies. That's the biggest, biggest thing. If you have a policy, you enforce them. Whether they be logs, whatever they are, you enforce them. You make sure to have cameras, uh, audible uh, indicators. You make sure to have camera systems. If need be, hire a, a guard or several guards. But you want to make sure that your lab is physically secure. Locks, cameras, doors, all of it. One of the next big things is auditing. So you have all of these policies, all of these procedures, you have cameras, you have guards. But have you ever verified? How do you know your protection is adequate? How do you make sure that people are following policies? How do you know that the cameras are really functioning? How do you know that the logs are really being taken care of? How do you know about the doors and locks and evidence logging? Well, you audit them. You verify every so many times. Uh, once a month, once a week, once a quarter, whatever appropriate for your environment. If you take care of it, you audit them just, just to make sure. So how do we determine the floor plan? Like how do we lay out our environment? So how do you configure the work area will depend on again our budget, our floor space, how many workstations we have. Normally ideally we want two workstations and one non-workstation with internet for some basic research. A small lab again, two forensic stations, one non-forensic workstation, a workbench, normally space allows, and some storage cabinets. It could be as simple as this. A workbench to do your work, a forensics PC to do your forensic investigation, a internet-based PC just to do searching, and some cabinets. Mid-sized labs are typically those in a private business. They have more workstations. They're going to have more exits and more safety responsibilities. They may have cubicles, they may have more space, they may have a, a more things, but the same general principles are going to apply. Locking cabinets, cameras, secure uh, the environment, all that good stuff. Here's an example, even if you have multiple workstations, you may have the forensics workstations separate from your internet workstations. State law enforcement or the FBI usually runs most of the larger or regional forensic labs. They have specialized evidence rooms. They have more custodians might be assigned to help manage and control traffic. They're going to log everything. And they're going to have, again, the appropriate controlled exits and entrances to where all of the evidence is going to be maintained. Here we have a, an appropriate floor plan for a larger environment. So how do we select a basic forensics workstation? This is going to be based off of your needs, based off of budgets, based off of how powerful you're going to need them. For example, you may not need a high-end machine if you're doing these basic mundane tasks, basic web searching. You may need a more heavy-hitting machine when you're dealing with more resource-heavy analysis. So it kind of just depends on what your needs are, how much money you have based off of your budget. Police labs normally have the most diverse need for computing investigation. So that lab may have a, a legacy system and software to match what's used in the community. While a small local police department might have one multi-purpose forensic workstation and one or two general purpose workstations. It just kind of depends. Some are using laptops with FireWire, USB, things of that nature. It kind of just depends on your environment. There is no cookie cutter. So requirements can be easily determined based off of the business that you conduct. 
if you are doing strictly for, uh, computer forensics and you're using access data. You're going to be looking at their software and their specs. That way you can choose the appropriate hardware and software. If you're dealing with NCASE, you're going to be again going to Guidance Software's website and verifying requ software requirements. Some general stock uh, hardware peripherals could be things like data cables, uh, the appropriate types of graphics type cards, hard drives, and some basic tools. Uh, licensed software, things like Office and uh, programming languages, if you're dealing with specialized viewers, some type of uh, general open office type licensings. If you're dealing with accounting software, you may have to have some appropriate accounting software to be able to open up retrieved items. Again, it just kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. The disaster recovery planning, DRP. How do you recover your lab from a catastrophic situation? Whether it be a virus, whether it be a lost drive and raid, there's lots of different things. A big part of this goes back to that configuration management. You keep track of the software. You keep track of the updates of your software. You keep track of your hardware and equipment. That way you always know kind of what you're currently running. There's no guessing about it. For labs using higher end RAID servers, you have to understand the different types of RAID, how they interact with everything. Risk management is always really good. How do we find for equipment upgrades? How do we know that the equipment is going to handle the newer hardware, software, or the equipment that we're going to be getting? Normally, we're only dealing with computer components that are going to be year and a half to three years max. We schedule upgrades every year and a half. Technology is constantly changing, so we have to make sure we evolve with it. Risk management involves determining how much risk is acceptable. Can we identify equipment that our lab depends on? And can we verify when it's going to be replaced? That way we're identifying the equipment and replacing it before it fails. Again, if we identify a key component and it happens to be we use that component every day and we only have one copy of it, what happens if it dies? Last major area is actually building a business case for developing a forensics lab. Can we sell our services? Can we uh, be a managed service provider? Can we demonstrate how we're going to use the lab and how we're going to help our organization maybe save money or increase profits? Compare cost of an investigation with the cost of a lawsuit. Maybe look at showing how we can do uh, protection of intellectual property, trade secrets, and other future type plans. So there's ways to propose this type of development. It just depends on your organization and if they'll allow it. Most of it goes back to justification. How do you justify to the person with the budget that this is going to be a good thing? big part of this also goes back into the budget development. That way we can show what our facility will cost, what the equipment will cost, software will cost, if there's going to be miscellaneous items that will be needed. And then we start the approval and acquisition process. Again, assuming that we're allowed to. We implement it at part of our business case. We describe how we'll implement it, how we'll do it. How we plan on our schedule, what is our timeline? If we plan on implementing it in the next six months, are we, make, are we going to make sure that we have the appropriate milestones? Are we going to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, timeline and dates? That way we can implement it within the appropriate time frame. Once we get everything, we in a business case, we include things like the acceptable testing. How do we verify? What about the additional time that we're going to leave for anticipate any of the issues, any of the correction for the acceptances. If we are going to assume this is going to work, 
but we don't build any time to have just in case what happens if there's a problem. Lastly, production. After all of the essential correctnesses have been made, we can go into production. All of this is going to be in your business case. The steps, the, the dates, the timeline, all of that. And that's actually the end of this chapter. Again, the important part here is we have to understand how our forensics lab is going to be used and how we're going to be conducting our investigations. Thank you.